Hey, Ben Chateau here with the Physical Therapy Advisor. I wanted to talk to you today about auto, autoimmune disease. Autoimmune disease is something that affects millions and millions worldwide. Sometimes as a physical therapist, this is something we can work with uh, a client directly with. Uh, other times with a diagnosis of autoimmune disease, it's something that will impact our plan of care and may impact the person's recovery, but we're not directly going to be treating uh, that particular diagnosis. It may be that we have to help the client get additional medical management to optimize his or her recovery. I recently had the privilege of working with New Hampshire's Therapy Association uh, to help educate some of their members on how to best work with clients that may have an autoimmune disease and how nutritional management can impact their care and how physical therapy and physical therapists can best work with those clients with all types of autoimmune conditions, from gastrointestinal issues to Crohn's disease, IBS, or uh, known as irritable bowel syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, you name it. There's a host of different um, autoimmune conditions out there. And I believe this presentation is as beneficial for the clinicians as it could be for clients. And so I hope you enjoy this presentation. Thank you. Um, if you have questions, comments, be sure to uh, leave them below. And also be sure to join me on um, Facebook and my website at The Physical Therapy Advisor. Thanks. Take care. Okay. Here we go. I Hopefully everyone can see the uh, normal uh, PowerPoint here, not my version of it. So if it looks funny, somebody speak up and let me know. That would be fantastic. Let me introduce myself here real quick. My name is Ben Chateau, um, and I also have my contact information here. So if there are questions after this presentation that somebody thinks of, I would love to uh, talk with you about it. Um, this is something that I, a topic I find very interesting, and my goal here is to kind of zoom us out and zoom us in. Early in my career, I was very blessed to uh, connect with a couple of DOs, Doctor of Osteopathic Medicines, that were also into functional medicine. And because of that, uh, when I was in the outpatient setting, I started to get a lot of referrals from them. And these types of referrals were not traditional referrals, um, like a total knee or a total hip or, or any of the other typical um, uh, orthopedic conditions you might see, because they always had a large baggage list of comorbidities. And that is probably not unique to anybody here, um, but it was unique in how it was getting addressed. And it started to open my eyes um, coming from traditionally working in a clinic and then now seeing these other types of patients. And that kind of what really spurred my interest in this. And so I, um, my goal today is to help broaden everyone's uh, understanding of what an autoimmune disorder can do for the physical therapy plan of care. So oftentimes, at least when I was young in my career, I would see um, a very large comorbidity list and then see, ah, they're here for their shoulder, disregard the rest, and boom, here we go, we're going to treat the shoulder. And that was um, a big mistake, I think, for a lot of my clients early on. So my goal was to help uh, zoom us out on what we need to look at and then zoom us in on what we can do uh, about that through these objectives. So obviously, as therapists, we come across a wide range of clients with autoimmune disorders, and some of them are going to be directly associated with why we're seeing the client. Um, rheumatoid arthritis, like Kim's been talking about, is a great one. We might get referrals directly to treat a client with rheumatoid arthritis or maybe a client with fibromyalgia, and that's their primary diagnosis. They're going to see us. They're going to, they need exercise advice, um, splinting. I mean, there's a whole host of things we might do for them. But an even larger majority of our clients are going to come to us for back pain, shoulder pain, the traditional stuff with a large comorbidity list that will include some form of autoimmune disease, if not multiple forms of autoimmune disease. As Kim mentioned, you tend to see them bundled and clustered. Um, and it makes sense for, you know, with the, those cogs that she described on why that would be. And that's going to impact our... Um, plan of care for that client. So back to the very basics of where we started in school is we have to take a thorough history. And that thorough history is going to matter. And it matters a lot because we need to know what comorbidities does our client have that's going to impact their plan of care. Maybe there's some special considerations. 
if we were to consider that client again that has rheumatoid arthritis and maybe it's somewhat advanced where they're really struggling with um, hand or wrist or finger pain and their post-op rotator cuff repair. So we're progressing them through their normal or quote unquote our normal rotator cuff protocols and we start to find out that, geez, they can't grip things the way some of our other clients grip things. Or uh, maybe they can't lay on their uninvolved side as easy because of, you know, the rheumatoid arthritis causing pain in their shoulder. There's a lot of different scenarios where it could impact um, that person. Again, delayed healing is, a, is a, something that we need to think about with clients with autoimmune disorder. And we're gonna talk about that in just a second, but a list or a partial list could be Crohn's disease, leaky gut syndrome, celiac, ulcerative colitis. So all those things are gonna potentially delay or impact our healing response because of the way they uptake nutrients. Another autoimmune disorder like Ehlers-Danlos, that can be a problem for um, some of our interventions, right? They, they might be hypermobile and that's something that we need to consider when we're prescribing our exercise or doing manual work with a client. So what are my thoughts on what impedes a person's recovery? So, well, this is um, a list that I've come up with over the years. And for me, um, for me is, are they even getting the right treatment, right? How many times have we been seeing someone for hip pain and really it was a lumbar condition all along? So first of all, we need to be treating the right cause of the problem. Secondly, maybe the injury just isn't capable of healing. Maybe they have a spinal cord injury, something that just can't heal. We have to teach them how to adapt and, and functionally improve. Maybe there's some psychological or social conditions, poor nutrition, which we're gonna to get to in a second, poor sleep quality, Maybe there are the actual causative or risk factors that led to the pain, the overuse syndrome, whatever it is, haven't been addressed. Maybe we haven't got to the root of the problem yet. And then of course, inflammation and oxidative stress, which goes back to nutrition and it goes back to having an autoimmune disease in general is going to increase a baseline inflammatory load. And when you're developing your plan of care for the client, did you think about this stuff? Did you think about that they have an autoimmune disease and that might increase the time it's going to take them to recover from maybe a standard surgery or a, a typical case of impingement in the shoulder or something like that? When it comes to gastrointestinal autoimmune disorders, many of these are going to have features that will impact the healing. And the reason this is, is no nutrients equals no healing or recovery. And, and this becomes a big problem for some of the autoimmune disorders that you might run across with your clients. Again, this is just part of the comorbidity list. You're not seeing them at, you know, for their leaky gut or the irritable bowel, but a lot of our clients have these issues. And if you really want to address the person um, as a whole person, then we need to make sure we're addressing these disorders with them at some level. And, it, and we're gonna get to that in just a second. So in my view, there's two basic reasons why a person's gonna have issues with this. There's either a delivery problem or an absorption problem. When it comes to a delivery problem, here's a list that could impact our care. Maybe this have cardiac impairment and the blood's not getting to where it needs to go and therefore you're not getting the nutrients to the tissue that needs to heal. This is the same with peripheral vascular disease, the same with diabetes. It's the same if there was a trauma to a particular area that's maybe impacted the, the per peripheral vasculature in that area. We all know it's common in different tissue types. Skin will heal much faster than cartilage or a ligament or a tendon, right? And partly that's because of how is the nutrient flow going to those tissues. If they smoke or vape is obviously an issue. We've got poor hydration, medication side effects. And then um, in more in regards to Kim and what she's been teaching us is the physical limitations, right? Can they even use their hands to prepare food? Is there an issue with their jaw that it would affect their ability to chew um, food? Um, maybe they're unable to prepare the food because they're too fatigued by the end of the day to, uh, to make a meal. So all these things come into play. 
there could be socioeconomic factors that are limiting the access to quality food. We know um, in lower socioeconomic groups that um, getting high quality, high nutrient dense food is an issue. Sometimes it's a financial issue and sometimes it's just not available for them in their particular area. And that's something that could impact um, their recovery as well. And then we have the nutrient absorption issues. And this really gets into the autoimmune disorder side uh, of things. So when you have Crohn's or irritable bowel or celiac or any of these things, you are not absorbing nutrients in the same way. Sometimes it is just going right through you too fast to absorb everything um, you need to absorb to get the nutrients your body might need. Sometimes there's food interactions. If you take too much zinc, that can affect iron absorption in females. And that's, that's another consideration when it comes to fatigue um, for, for some of our folks that might be anemic. We also know that diabetes and smoking will affect absorption issues, um, not just in the gut, but in the actual tissue. So in either scenario, whether it's a nutrient delivery problem or an absorption problem, the injured area that you're working with or the tissue you're trying to address isn't getting the adequate nutritional and growth factors that it needs to improve and improve at maybe the rate um, we would typically expect. So just like a person that's diabetic, you would tend to factor in a little bit longer plan of care knowing they probably are not going to recover as fast as someone that's healthy and doesn't have diabetes. Um, you should think about autoimmune disease in the same way. If you see irritable bowel syndrome and Crohn's and leaky gut syndrome as diagnoses, then it's likely, just like a diabetic, they are not going to heal as quickly as some of their more healthy cohorts, just because that autoimmune disease is going to affect them in such different ways. And like most things, um, because it's systemic, you know, the systemic issues that we see in these um, GI-related autoimmune disorders are definitely impacted by the foods we eat. And what's interesting about this, um, at least in my, uh, in my practice and what I've run into, is not all rheumatologists um, or autoimmune disease specialists understand or I guess give credence that diet and nutrition have such an impact on a person's life. And I think that's improving. I've noticed it improving um, a lot over the years, but it's still, it's still with us where um, it's not even on the secondary radar of some of these physicians to have dietary consults as part of an ongoing full spectrum management of their disorder. I do, I do think that's changing and I hope that it's changing, at least in my area. So when it comes to diet, we all know, and I'm, at least I would assume most of us would know, we have anti-inflammatory foods and we have pro-inflammatory foods. Some of this is really obvious, but the more we learn, the more we learn, it's not as obvious as you might think. And the reason is, is as we dig into this, we have learned, and this research is really forthcoming and it's really fascinating that we're probably not even eating for ourselves. We're probably just eating for the bacteria that live inside of us. And so every time you have a hankering for, you know, whatever food you like, it might not even be you that's craving that. It could be your flora, your intestinal flora, that is craving whatever that particular thing is. And that might be a good thing or it might be a bad thing. And so I would suspect over the years and as we start to learn more about the importance of our uh, bacterial flora inside of us, uh, some of these recommendations will change and, and it's going to get more nuanced and hopefully more specific to the person. I think that's where we're heading where it is not going to be a broad-based diet for everyone. It's going to be an individual diet based on a, a laundry list of epigenetic factors um, for the clients. And I think that's good. And I think you're going to see that across medicine in general. You're already seeing it with some of the designer drugs where they're looking at genetic testing and then design, then deciding what is the best medication for that particular person. And diet is getting that way too, where you can't just blanketly say 
everybody should eat Brussels sprouts or everybody should eat quinoa uh, because it turns out those things aren't true. And certain things that are quote unquote good for you might not be good for somebody else. One of the things that can be very helpful is food sensitivity testing. This is something that is becoming a lot more mainstream and many even primary care providers will do this type of testing. Um, in my area, the, the physicians I've worked with, they were both functional or are, um, there's three now, um, functional medicine experts, and they do a lot of food sensitivity testing. And that will give you an idea of one, which foods to absorb or to avoid. And then two, um, gives you one more clue as to what might be going on when it comes to nutrient absorption and really a baseline inflammatory um, load. And, and, and I really liked Kim's cogwheel approach because what we do know is foods can definitely inflame us. And if you have autoimmune disease, you already have higher inflammation. And so when you think back to those three cogs, the higher the inflammation load, the more it's going to impact the other two uh, cogs. So when you go back and look at these slides, keep that in mind that if we can shrink that overall base load of inflammation, we are going to impact the, the clients in a lot of really positive and good ways. So... Um, as a blanket statement, what we can say is a whole foods plant-based diet needs to be pursued in some form. That doesn't mean everyone needs to be vegan or even everyone needs to be vegetarian, but it does mean that people need to go towards more whole foods um, and more of a plant-based diet. So like I said initially, we really need to focus on that thorough medical history so we can listen to the details of what the client's telling us. And this is not just in regards to, hey, I have someone with autoimmune disease coming to see me today. It's, hey, I have someone with shoulder pain seeing me today. Oh, and look, in my history, I found out they also have autoimmune disease. And now I need to potentially address that. And so this is where that comorbidity list really matters. And we need to... Um, we need to address that with the client in some way, shape, or form. And that is the question, right? Is this something through our history taking that we decide, gosh, this person has never had a dietary consult. They seem like they're a mess. They haven't eaten at home in the last hundred days. And they obviously are struggling with food intake. Maybe they're obese. Um, maybe all they eat is fast food they're gonna need some serious workup. Or maybe they're, they're not even sure. Maybe everything they, they tell you sounds a lot like they got a gut problem and it's out of our scope to diagnose that, but we can sure recognize that, hey, this can impact how you recover and these are the reasons why. Let's get you hooked up with a consult from a functional medicine practitioner and just see, right? Let's see if through physical therapy, we can help that shoulder and I'll get you hooked up to a really cool physician that's going to help you get your irritable bowel or what sounds like irritable bowel in check. And um, sometimes these things we're going to be able to treat ourselves. And then sometimes we just monitor what patients will come to us and they're dialed in and that's great. We'll just treat them for what, what they come to us with and move on um, and just kind of monitor as we go. So like I said, diet really plays a critical factor in autoimmune disorders. Um, in all types of autoimmune disorders. And you can't ignore that, right? So we know a poor diet will increase systemic inflammation, which will trigger all the other aspects that we don't want when it comes to autoimmune disease. And that includes arthritis of all kind and including the gastrointestinal um, autoimmune disorders. And we know that this research is changing and it's developing rapidly and it's getting a lot better. Finally, they're starting to see the role of, of inflammation and in the guts, the intestinal flora, and um, autoimmune disease. And then the question is, is, is this even in our scope of practice? Well, the physical or APTA says that it is. And here's a link to um, some information on the APTA website 
when it comes to PTs and the discussion of nutrition and diet with our clients. Now, interestingly, as most things in our profession, this is Practice Act specific. So what I can do in Idaho might be different than what you guys can do in New Hampshire or somebody in Oregon or Florida, who knows, right? But check your Practice Acts and see where is the line on that scope. And like Kim suggested, let's practice to the edge of that scope and not be stuck in the middle. Also, this is patient specific. So some of our patients don't need any advice from us on diet and a whole bunch of them do. And then the, our goal is how much advice is needed and is it within my personal wheelhouse or my scope of education to give them? I think all of us on here can say the obvious things like, man, you need to drink less soda. You need to eat less sugar, right? but maybe they need something really specific. And that's where having those other uh, relationships in your communities are going to be really important. And where's your skill set? I have been blessed to work with certain physicians that have taught me a lot. So I feel very comfortable engaging in these conversations with my clients. But I can tell you my first few years in practice, I was not comfortable and we did not engage in this information. And now um, it's rare that I don't have it come up in conversation throughout our treatment sessions. This is something that's um, just kind of evolving and I'm excited about it. I think it's got a ways to go, but there are now some nutritional based certifications out there. Here's a link to one of them. Um, this is, uh, it's called a certified nutritional physical therapist. And I think we're gonna see a lot more of this coming. Uh, the APTA is encouraging us to um, address diet as part of our scope, but I think a lot of us probably feel, mm, I don't think I know enough to, to, to do that. And that's okay. That is a great place to start. So let's get some additional information so we can feel confident in addressing this with our clients, because it's not just our clients with autoimmune disease that need us to talk about nutrition. It's all of our clients that need us to talk about nutrition. We have all known for a long time that if you're diabetic, you are not going to heal from your surgery as well. Or if you are obese, that could um, impact how your knee is functioning. And so diet has to be part of that conversation. Also, if you're not familiar with functional medicine, here's a link to their website. I would suggest reading up on it. And then I would highly suggest reaching out to people in your area that practice this and get to know them. Maybe even do a consultation yourself to see how this process works. And I can tell you, I have seen it, um, it life-changing is all I can say. And it's been amazing to see clients that have had, and I know this sounds crazy, but I've, I've had a client that had the worst allergies I have ever seen in a man. And he had done all the shots and all the medicines and he just never could breathe. And he went and saw one of our local functional medicine um, practitioners. And literally within two weeks, he said, I, he's never breathed as good as he breathes right now. And it was just by changing some dietary um, things and giving them uh, a different herb, basically, that would help his inflammation that was directed just for him. It was crazy. I mean, he was basically in tears telling me about it. He couldn't, he couldn't believe it. He couldn't lay on the table for me to address his shoulder because he couldn't breathe. So he had been sitting upright forever. And so uh, learn about functional medicine. Um, it's really an interesting aspect of care.